Y'all turn to Matthew 7. We're going to talk about judgment again. And what I want to do, I want to start. I want to sort of read y'all a few quotes. I'm all the time finding ones that I like, and I never, and I always think, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if some people get offended by it. I, look, man, if somebody said something and it's true, it's true. It, use it. If that's you, can use it in the way. Nothing new in yourself. There ain't nothing new. <laughs> but what people generally tend to think is they say, well, oh, see, he's been reading so and so. Now I see why he's perverted. No, come on, man. Just don't be scared to read something. Use, use your Bible to judge things. But I just want to read y'all a couple quotes. The first one says, Padley, some man's name, who was a well known natural simpleton. In other words, this was just some guy in the town that was known to be, didn't have all his marbles, okay? was wont to say, God help the fool. Well, don't think about that for a minute. A man that's a fool, you know, and I don't mean these terms offensive. Today everything's... And somebody got in trouble for saying retarded the other day, I heard. But what we're talking about here is a man that wasn't very bright said, God help the fool. None are more ready to pity the folly of others than those who have a small share of wit themselves. Isn't that true? Yeah. He says... There is no love among Christians, cries the man who's destitute of true charity. Zeal has vanished in the church, exclaims the idle talker. Oh, for more consistency among these believers, groans the hypocrite. We want more vital godliness, protests a false believer. As in the old legend, the wolf preached against sheep stealing. So very many hunt down those sins in others which they gladly shelter in themselves. Now, there's a lot of truth to that. Charles Spurgeon said that. What he's basically saying is, we are we tend to attack things that we don't like about ourselves. And a person will usually, uh, we talked the other day about overacting. When a person is professing to be a Christian, they usually will go overboard with their uh, approach to holiness and all that sort of thing. And this is what this is about in Matthew, because we're fixing to deal with the judgment of Jesus Christ before, from one that just professes to believe on him and one that actually believes on him. And that judgment ain't for me and you to make. It's for the Lord to make. Now I'm going to read you another one. You are not needlessly to provoke or attack upon yourself. Or, sorry. You are not needlessly to provoke attack upon yourself or upon the higher truths of the gospel. You're not to judge. You're not to act without judgment. Count not men to be dogs or swine, but when they avow themselves to be such, or by their conduct as if they are such, don't put occasion in their way for displaying their evil character. Okay? I'm a, it's more here, but just think about what he's saying. If I know a man's lost, and I know that man is not in a mind to hear the gospel, right? And I go forcing the gospel in front of him and evoking a, a horrible reaction out of him, man, I've just hurt him. I haven't helped him. I've just brought more condemnation on him. Did you see? So that's not the attitude, he says. Saints are not to be simpletons. They are not to be judges, but also they are not to be fools. Great King, with a capital K, Christ, how much wisdom thy precepts require? I need thee not only to open my mouth, but I also need thee at times to keep it shut. That's now that's good advice, isn't it? Okay. Once again, that's Charles Spurgeon. He a lot of good horse sense. Now, here comes the next one. This, everybody's heard of a man named Jonathan Edwards? Yeah. Zeal should always be tempered by prudence. There are times when it would be treason to, uh, truth, treason to truth to introduce as a topic of conversation when men are in such a frame of mind that they will be sure to rather cavil it and hate it than to believe it. Not only speak thou well, but speak thou at the right time, for silence is sometimes golden. See that thou hast thy measure of golden silence as well as of silver speech. In other words, use some discernment. Yeah. Now, if you know, look, I know there have been times that people, I, I used to go to somebody and ask them a question, knowing what their answer would be, just to evoke the, the contrast where I could bring up my doctrine and show them where they're wrong. Man, that's about stupid. I mean, that's just foolish. I was guilty of that, too. Hey, you, well, you know, don't miss doubt. That's what we were taught. And it's because it's a, it's, and I don't mean by any one man. I mean, that's just any time you have, if you're trusting that you have some lock on the truth that nobody else has, naturally, that's going to be your attitude. Yeah, you're sure. going yeah, to have to go at people that way. But the better way is to just talk about the cross. 
Start with the cross, talk about the cross, and you'll find there's a lot of people you can fellowship with. And as you move, in, move out away from the cross in your conversations, there'll be things that you see differently. But it won't be seen as an attack. It won't be like that at all. It'll be two brothers discussing something. But if you start out there at that point, you never get to the cross, do you? Y'all know when you start talking to folks, the first thing they're going to want to do if they're not interested is detract you. And I mean professed believers. Great example is Jesus and the woman at the well. Remember her? Jesus told her point blank. He said, out of my belly go living waters. He's telling her about salvation, wasn't he? And he said... He told that woman, he said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, that's right. You've had five men and the one you went now ain't your husband. Now he was putting his finger on the spot that hurt, wasn't he? What's her natural reaction? To divert, to divert the conversation. She said, oh yeah, well y'all you, you say that we need to worship at the temple mountain down there. We say up here, what do you say? And Jesus basically said, I said, don't get off on that stuff. Let's keep talking about what we're talking about. <laughs> That's what he did. But that's what people want to do. Y'all know you start talking about the gospel and folks, people will bring up stuff that has no bearing on it. I'm not saying it's not conversations that wouldn't be good to have, but it's not, it's not, that, that it's a waste of time at that point. Okay. Now, one more. Move on, you're saying. Absolutely. D.L. Moody. A great many are zealous to convert the world who are themselves unconverted. There's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Okay, now let's deal with this judgment. What I want to do is I want to just show you how the judgment is here in chapter 7. Look at what he's saying. First, he tells us not to judge. To use discernment in our preaching, right? <coughs> to judge what it is we're doing. To use common spiritual sense. Now, it's not common sense. Common spiritual sense. Now, he talks about verse 7 immediately. Prayer. Why do y'all reckon he immediately follows up on these things <coughs> he's just said about prayer? Where are you going to get discernment? you got to pray to the Lord. Let the Lord help you with these things. He said, Lord, hey, this is a hard thing to know when to do and what not to do. Well, then let the Lord guide you. Ask Him in prayer. Now, he goes on in verse 13. He says, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now, I want to make sure we get this point out of this, because if we don't, I'll file it up. All right? There's a narrow gate, isn't it? Now let's just say here there's a wide gate. Basically, what they would do, and I've watched John Wayne do this before in the movies. You let your sheep out every day to go feed, right? You bring them, you lead them out, you feed them, you walk but in the evening, you got to get them back in, don't you? Well, when you get them back in, you can't just push them all in there because you've got to, y'all all heard the term pass under the rod. That means count them, doesn't it? How are you going to know if you got them all? You count them. The Lord said he had a hundred sheep, right? He knew it's a count. So as they're coming back in from feeding, out in the world, you bring them in, and at first you start to funnel them in, don't you? The wide gate funnels them towards it, right? But then how do they come in through the narrow gate? One at a time, okay? One at a time. Now there are those that are out here that never come into here. So let's make three groups. Tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to put uh, green out here. Uh, number one, okay. Then we'll make blue number two. And we'll make red number three. Now, are there those people that don't even approach on anything that even seems like they want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ? Sure. Hey, no, they don't profess to believe nothing. Matter of fact, you say Jesus Christ, they'll trample you. The swine and the dogs, right? They're out here. They're not looking to enter in here, are they? But are there a bunch from this group that do come in here nigh unto things, yeah. that do hear the general gospel call or see the attributes associated with it or whatnot, that do come in here uh, attracted to something by it. There are. But of that group, how many actually pass in through the narrow gate? Narrow. Very few. Very few, okay. So what he's going to be doing in this chapter is not judging this group. He ain't even going to address this group, folks. He's just told us the attributes or the attitudes of what a Christian will be, hadn't he? Well, by saying that, what's that going to make it possible for folks to do? 
imitate them, isn't it? Yeah. He's just told us that here's how you need to act and do and don't do like the hypocrites do. And what's a hypocrite doing? Acting. 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 And in chapter 7, he's going to say, I'll take, I'll judge between the actor and the real thing. And that's all he's doing. It's a judgment between the actor and the real thing. Now watch what he says in verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Then what are they trying to look like? Like you, like the real thing. Y'all see, this is an imitator, isn't it? What would be the first thing one of these false prophets that's trying to look like a sheep would have to publicly do? Had to profess that he believes on Christ, wouldn't he? He would profess with his mouth that he believes Jesus is the same. He would. He would have to to be part of this this visible group. Okay. Now he goes on and says about the difference between the good tree and the corrupt tree. Both of them are bringing forth fruits, aren't they? Mm -hmm. This bunch out here ain't got no fruit to be judged. This group in here's got some fruit and this group's got some fruit. And the Lord said one of these is growing on a natural tree and one's growing on a spiritual tree. Can me and you decide between those fruits? We can begin to, to look at them and get some kind of idea, but ultimately the, what we're talking about here is we're talking about God's judgment between the person that believes and the person that just says he believes. Now look at, he goes on, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. What is that? That's a profession of faith. Not everyone that says unto me, Jesus, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, now watch what they say, make some believers. Have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works? Are they doing the things that in their mind looks like a Christian? Yes. But are they Christians? No. He says, then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me that work iniquity. Now, after all of this speech, he goes on to say, therefore, whosoever uh, heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon earth. So he's talking to all the people that had heard. And he said, it's like you're building your house on one of two things. This group builds their house upon the sand. And what does the Lord do with every house? He tests it. He tries it. It's faith. This group's faith is as sand. It's not real faith. It's a professing faith, but it ain't real. So when the Lord blows on that house, what happens? Falls down. It falls down. How about this house? It's founded on a rock. And when the Lord blows on it, it stands. He said it's like a flood coming. How is the, we pictured the devil in the book of Revelation goes after God's people with a flood out of his mouth, doesn't he? You ever notice that a person that really believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can fall over into bad doctrine and walk in it for a long time. But if you're sincere and you keep going to the Lord asking for the truth, He'll pull you back, won't He? You might lose years doing this. It don't mean you lost. But what about a person that's always ready to believe whatever the latest thing is? You know what I mean? You don't test it, don't try it. You just believe it and fall, okay? Foolish man. It's a foolish man. Okay, now that's the kind of judgment we're talking about. Now in light of that, I want y'all to go to Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to deal with this. Mr. Al came in the door asking about this. Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 6. Let's deal with 3 first. Now we're going to read Hebrews 3, 6. By the way, I need to remind everybody watching that we won't be on Wednesday night. I forget the... Or Thursday. Or Thursday night if you watch Thursday's podcast. Yeah. All right. Hebrews 3, verse 6. Now, everybody in here has heard this verse, cherry-picked. Y'all know what cherry-picking means, don't you? He, me and Mr. Isle knows what that means. You building something with building materials and somebody gets to the place before you and picks through the pilot and gets the best, huh? You go to Home Depot today to get a 2 by 4 and you know what you got to do? <laughs> you got to get the top 35 off of there. Don't you? Somebody's done pick through them. That's cherry picking. He says, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of, our, uh, of, our, of the hope firm unto the end. And a man says, see there, these people that this is written to could lose their salvation. We've all heard that, haven't we? Now, first off, I want y'all to answer this. What kind of salvation is salvation that can be lost? That ain't salvation. 
what kind of life could be everlasting life, eternal life one day, and then cease to exist the next? What kind of God would save a man later to realize he'd made a mistake? Folks, God did, look, the idea that anyone ever was saved and didn't have eternal security is just, it's a, it's a blasphemy against God. Let's read this in context, okay? Now, first off, the book of Hebrews is written to who? Hebrews. It's written to Jewish professing Christians. They have all professed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, what's still going on amongst them? The law, the ceremonies. So the writer is telling them, essentially, you've said one thing with your mouth, but your actions are saying something else. Now, here's where the, this all gets muddy for people today. We have had introduced to us something by the whole idea of the Roman road and whatnot. Look, do I think anyone's ever been saved by the verses on the Roman road? Certainly. But there's an idea passing around today that if you just get somebody to confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, they'll be saved. I was in a lady's room one time and a young guy come in with a laminated card, interrupted Bible study and asked her if he could pray with her. And she said, well, what do you want me to pray for you for? And he said, no, I want you to pray this and handed her the card. In other words, if he could just get her to repeat those words, he thought she'd be saved. Now, does anyone in here believe that? No. no Y'all know we have a lot of friends that believe if you'll just believe, if you, you believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And they say, yeah, I believe that. Then you're saved. Don't forget about it. Who cares? Folks, faith is, is put to the test. God tests his faith. Not for God's knowledge, for ours. Watch what he's saying here. Now, in the context, when God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, did every one of them that come out of there profess to believe something? They put the blood on their doorpost, didn't it? Then they professed to believe, didn't it? Okay? They come through the Red Sea. They all come out there. When they got in the wilderness, what happened? Yeah. You found out a lot of them that professed to believe really didn't. Mm -hmm. Folks, you get a man under the right circumstances and he'll profess anything. You put him under, that's they say is the problem with torturing people. You know, like the CIA or whatnot, torture someone. Well, I ain't saying we should or shouldn't. I'm just saying you you. Start pulling my fingernails out and I'll probably tell you anything you want to hear. You know, yeah, I blew them towers up. It was me, right? <laughs> to stop it. But when God got these people out here in the wilderness, He began to show something, didn't He? He showed the difference between the professor of faith and the possessor of faith. He said Abraham was tested and Abraham was justified. That doesn't mean Abraham was saved when he was tested. It means what he said he believed, he really believed. Now, he's talking about that kind of thing. These people have professed. Now, watch the example he uses. Starting in verse 3. Let's just read the whole chapter. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Is this a group of people that's looking for an earthly inheritance? Is it? In Hebrews 3.1. Are these three... Have these Hebrews been made part partaker of an earthly or a heavenly calling? Heavenly. He says, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Why well, y'all reckon he says that? He's dealing with people that have professed to believe. Confessed. Christ Jesus, who was faithful. See, the issue is being faithful. Now, did Christ come saying he was the Son of God? Yeah. Did he prove it? Yes. He says, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Did Moses prove that he was actually what he said he was? Yes. His actions proved it, didn't it? He said, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, and as much as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now Moses was the head of a house, the house of Israel, wasn't he? But Jesus Christ is building another house, the house of God. What would it say about the master builder if he put a stone in that house and later realized he had to chisel it out? He didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. Now, who's the stones in the house of God? The believers are. So he says, verse 5, Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. That means that was all types of the gospel, wasn't it? But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are we, the body of Christ, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now that doesn't mean you're saved and you're in the body. Now if you can hang on to it, 
It means if you hang on to it, you're saying. Yeah. Okay, watch him say that. Since it is, it's, it's it's not like saying if maybe it means yeah. like I'm. Uh, well, uh, Lexi, if you're going to heat lasagna, I'll have two pieces, right? Since now, watch. Let's read it. Verse seven. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. By the way, this is not one day. The day in the wilderness lasted 40 years. Did they have 40 years to believe God? Did they? No, most of them didn't. He says, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Are these talk? Is this a group of people that have known his ways and turned from them? Yep. Yes. No. no. Have no. not known my ways. No. Oh, they know his ways. They know his words. That's right. Oh. All they knew was what they saw. Yes. Did they have faith? No. We're going to see in a minute. Now, he says next verse. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now that rest was a type, was Canaan, wasn't it? But what's Canaan a type of? It's new, yeah. new heaven, earth. It's the, it's the real inheritance. Now he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of committing some sin after you've been saved. Mm -hmm. How about an evil heart of backsliding? Mm -hmm. What's the evil heart? Unbelief. Folks, this ain't people that believed one day and later decided not to believe. This is people that profess to believe something to get out of circumstances and come to find out they didn't believe. Now, how did he find out they didn't believe? He flooded the house. He tested the faith. He says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. In other words, while you can still hear. You ever notice you preach the gospel to someone and it has a profound effect? They're startled by the, what they've heard. But if they don't believe it, the next time you preach it to them, they're a little less startled. Mm -hmm. Then when they've heard it 30 times, it doesn't even affect them, does it? Okay, he says, Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now this doesn't mean if they commit sins, they go at No. The deceitfulness of sin, again, is that it promises things it won't deliver. Now next, for, because... We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now again, that seems like he's saying, well, if, no. Look, it's like saying this. Uh, Alright. I would be proven to be my father's son by the DNA that's in me. Wouldn't I? That verified. He, George verified the other day that he's got, was it 17% Irish? 11% 11. 11 okay George is 11% a Mick now think about that hey you wouldn't think so looking at him would you you probably wouldn't think looking at me that I'm whatever percentage African I am but I'm sure it's in there but here's the point what proves what you are the test what's in you well what's the proof of God's children faith faith is a gift folks it's a gift of God so he says if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said, Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was He grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Now again, someone would say, See, they believed, but they sinned. Right? And they say, that's the problem. If you sinned and you were Jewish, then you were lost. Well, what about David? What about Moses? What about Abraham? What about all human beings? Who's going to be saved under those conditions? Nobody. Watch what their sin was. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. Then the if in here isn't an if you hang on to something. It's God tests and proves the difference, doesn't it? Let's keep reading. So we see that they could not enter in because of backsliding. Unbelief. Unbelief. Then what's the if hinged on in here? 
Faith. It's faith. It's a, it, look, he's not, it's not a conditional thing. What he's saying to these people is, look, since you're the children of God, it, this, is gonna, this is how it'll be. In the wilderness, there was a group that was God's children, wasn't there? I'll give you an example. Joshua and Caleb. Were they walking with God? When they went into the land, what did Joshua and Caleb say? We can do it. Did Joshua and Caleb say we can do it? And God said, "Boy, look at these two. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do something for them." No. Or did they say what they said because they belong to God? Right. Hey, that's the idea. You don't do something to gain something with God. God produces that thing in you if you're His. So let's go straight into chapter four. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now here comes the verse. Man, this verse right here would have straightened every one of us out long ago if we'd have just believed it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Was the gospel preached to them people out there? Yeah. Wasn't preached in plain language, but it was preached in symbols and types, wasn't it? And is the gospel preached today? It is. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So what was the problem? Yeah, faith. Faith. Now, what is faith? A gift. A gift. Yeah. How do you get faith? Yeah. Hearing. Hearing, hearing by the God. Word of God. Who's got to open the ears so you can hear? God. Y'all see how the gift works? You see, by the way, that mixed, it's the same word also that's mingled, right? Y'all know, again, I don't want to bore anybody. But I know nobody cares about anything Greek. But one of the wonderful things about the Greek language is this. It has a voice attached to each verb. Mm -hmm. And the voice tells you who's actually performing the action. Right? For instance, active verse. If this uh, verb right here were active, it would mean, hey, you didn't add faith to the message. That would be, God spoke and you should have put your faith to it and believed it. But that ain't what it is. Mm -hmm. It's passive. Mm -hmm. Passive means you're being acted on. Now what does that mean? These inverted sentences, and then you see that kind of passive voice. But if you put the bottom, the back part at the front, then you'll see the active tense of it. Let's read it that way. This part. Which one? Which one? Okay. Uh, two. Okay. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So if you said not being mixed with faith with with faith in them that heard it. The word of God did not profit them. Yeah, that's so exactly what it means. Inverted, so we put it back. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Hey, look, if uh, all right, if I had some epoxy, y'all all familiar with epoxy, right? Epoxy's got two parts, right? Correct. It's got a resin and it's got a hardener. Okay, it's some kind of chemical reaction causes it. I could fill this cup with resin, and that cup could sit there for forty years. Is it going to get hard? No. Why not? Have it ain't mixed with the counterpart. I got part A, but there ain't no part B, right? Does the gospel call go out? Look, I'm going to do it this way. Let's just say here's, we'll just do it like this, okay? The gospel call goes out in general to all the world, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And look, we, I mean, there's men preaching the gospel right now, places they ought not be. We just covered that. And I don't mean parts of the world they ought not be. I mean in scenarios and situations. But it goes out unto all men, doesn't it? We all agree with that? Yeah. You know how you can prove that? Because how did these false believers get in? They heard a call. They heard a message, didn't they? That's the general universal call. Preach the gospel to all creatures, right? But then we're told whom God did foreknow. Then he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, them who he foreknew, all of them, he did what? He, he predestinated. And then he predestinated, he called. And them he called, he justified. And then he justified, he glorified. Does it ever say some of whom he did? No. So then is there a more specific call that goes out? Yeah. Folks, there's the individual call that goes right into the heart of the believer. And it's part A and it's part B. What does God do? He sends the words and He mingles it with faith. And then what happens? It brings forth fruit. 
that, that, that come together. So again, in this context, we're not talking about people that heard it, believed it, and then later backslid. No, that's not it at all. We're talking about God showing the difference between the two. Now, let's read verse 3 again. <clears throat> For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Did they have the gospel preached unto them? Yeah. Did they profess to believe it? Yes. Did they? No. There's yeah. what the Hebrews is talking about. You know, Brother Troy, going back to the uh, verse uh, 6, mm -hmm. that hold fast the confidence, that word hold fast in the Greek means remember. Really? You know, they didn't remember the confidence. He's telling you and I to remember the confidence. Yeah. These people of unbelief didn't have that confidence. No, never when they were tested, as you said, it showed that their confidence was not in God. They never, mm -hmm. never possessed the thing. Mm -hmm. They professed it, but they don't possess it. Yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. point. Okay, so now, if me and you just think about the judgment over here, y'all think about how the Lord said He's coming. When He's coming, He said He'll judge the sheep and the goats. Right? You go out and get a herd of sheep and just push them all into a place and you'll get to looking and say, man, we got some goats mixed in, wouldn't it? Go out, let Sully go out and herd all the cats in the neighborhood and you'll wind up having a dog or two mixed in, won't you? You're going to have those things. But the Lord said He'd separate them, didn't He? It's amazing. People act like this is salvation by works. Come on, that's against everything in the Bible. The Lord said on that day when He judges the sheep and the goats, okay? I'm going to put the sheep in blue, oh, no, I messed that up already. I'm going to put the goats in blue, and I'll put the sheep in red. What was that criteria he said he was going to use to judge them? Y'all remember Matthew 25? The fruit. He said to this group, come unto me. He said, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Naked, you clothed me. Y'all remember, jail, you visited me. And they said, when did we visit you? He said, when you did it unto any of these, the least of my brethren, you did it unto me. Then they, people say, they don't even know what they know at that moment then, don't they? Did they do the works he told them to do? Yeah. Then what did that prove? Yeah. He's judging their fruit. You know what he calls them? Come ye righteous into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What's the only way a man can be, right, can be righteous? Well, just by faith. So, this group has faith plus works. This group, he says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't help me. I was naked, I was this, I was that. And they said, when did we ever deny you? He said, when you denied my brethren. Mm -hmm. So then this group professed, didn't they? But they didn't possess. They didn't possess. No works. What's the old saying? If it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, it's quacks a duck. like a duck, it's a duck. Right? Well, God tests his faith. And you can just, he does this over and over. These, it's always the same. Y'all remember the ten virgins, right? They all looked like virgins, didn't they? They all had lamps. They all come forth, right? Y'all remember what five of them were missing? Oil. What's oil the type of? The Holy Spirit. Boy, they looked the part and they sounded the part and they're ready to go into the wedding. But do they get in? How about the man that tries to come in with the wrong garment on? It's the same thing. The division is never between... Uh, the real person and the horrible pagan. Now this is what most people believe today. They believe anybody that will profess with their mouth is in part of the fold, aren't they? Folks, if that was the case, the Lord wouldn't need to have this judgment. He wouldn't need to divide sheep and goat. He wouldn't need to do any of those things. If that was the case, there wouldn't need to be any judgment when He comes. He would just say, anybody that's professing, come on in. But what did He say about many that say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord? Lord, Lord. They don't know you. Now y'all think about it. Is it possible that the Lord was not aware that they existed? No. Then what does no mean in the context? Did He have an intimate relationship with them? Yeah. Never, never knew you. Never knew. 
And look, literally, y'all know the first time no is used in the Bible. Adam knew his wife. When Adam knew his wife, he placed something in Eve, didn't he? Seed. Right? What are we told happens when a person is saved? The seed's in them. The seed is in that person. And what's the, what's the proof that the seed of God is in that person? The fruit. That seed's going to produce fruit. Just as sure as... God. Folks, what would it say for God to plant a thing and not be able to make it fruitful? You see what I'm talking about? God made that thing bear fruit in spite of he, Wayne tells me all the time, some of the best things Wayne's ever planted, he didn't plant. He grew in his compost pile. Most God do better than me and you in a cockpit, doesn't he, Wayne? Yes, sir. Y'all know that's how it is, isn't it? Okay, so then in the context, what we're talking about here is that faith always has those works that go along with it. John said it this way about this group. They professed to believe, but they didn't. How did, what proved they didn't believe? Did they see their brother and sister naked and destitute? Yeah. Yeah, what did they say? They'll find you. Yeah. Well, I hope you find you something. Yeah. Come on, honey. Let's go. Yeah. Right? Flip over to James 2. In that particular case, it's the general call. Yeah. Many are called, but few are chosen. But everyone that's chosen is called. Yeah. That's a good I'm going to ask you something about that. When we first started talking about that, you said that you, they released the sheep out through the wide gate and they just all go out in the herd. Yep. And so this body of Christ released onto the world. So the body of Christ is, is condemnation to the world. So that's the true result that the body of Christ does to the world. It gives you one and it gives you two. But only that hundred is going to get back through the narrow gate and come back in. That's right. And he can't lose a one. You're right. He, it literally, it's, if you think what God did, God has to have mercy on the world. You talk about the love of God. Now, I don't even understand this, but I'll just say it. God has got to show mercy on all the world because he spread his seed out there. The elect's out there. And he threw them out there in a figure of speech to perform a task, right? And George just said it. They're performing a task. But this group is labeled because of them. This group is labeled because of them. And this group returns into the fold. And that's what God did. Just like with Israel, it's a type. He took his people and scattered them in all the world. And then what did he do? He drew them back in a rim. And I mean, that's, that's the same picture. Is that the, where the narrows the way through there all that kind of yep. comes from? That's it. Wide is the, is the gate that people that hear and say, oh yeah, I believe that. Narrows the way that the true children of God. You know, I just heard something just today about the Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And so not only did he show an opening, but those words presented many barriers. So he shut it off he sure to did. many places, many barriers there, and he left that one open. He sure did. And folks, if you don't belong to the shepherd, you ain't getting into the fold. And if you do belong to the shepherd, you coming in. There ain't no getting. I mean, this look to say that you could belong to him one day and later not is, is defaming him. To say you could belong to him and him leave you is defaming him. You can't get out. You can't look. You got, we got to get our eyes off of ourselves and look at the Lord. Because yeah. what we're talking about is the strength and power of God. We no. might deny him, but he can't deny, he can't deny us. That's right. He's faithful. We're not. That's exactly what it is. If this was about any uh, faithfulness or enduring, as they always teach, y'all know what we're taught that Peter and them had to keep the law, otherwise they'd be lost. We'll read it. Did Peter keep the law? No. He's up there eating with Gentiles. That ain't law keeping, is it? I ain't saying it was wrong. I'm just saying he didn't keep it. Okay, now watch 2.14. What doth it profit my brethren, though a man may say he have faith? So we're talking about somebody that professes to have faith, right? James 2.14 And have not works. Can faith save him? In other words, that man says, I've got faith, but he don't have the works. Can that faith save him? Yeah. See, the people say here in general, that means he can't be saved by faith. No, it means that faith won't save him. Yeah, and watch him say it. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, 
And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit you? Folks, that's the sheep and the goats, isn't it? Yeah. Y'all think about, I mean, you got to, okay, uh, you know, pick somebody, uh, I use Chris, Chris never gets mad at me. Chris comes in today, and he just looks horrible. I mean, his, he's, he just looked horrible. We all know there's something wrong with him, right? Say, Chris, what's wrong? He said, oh, man, I fell on hard times. And say, well, I mean, why you look so bad? He said, well, I'll be honest with you, I ain't eight in, you know, four days. I said, man, I hate to hear that, you know. Good luck. I hope things pick up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. That would be really nice. But, I mean, can you all imagine that? Why you're eating a donut. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then at the same uh -huh. breath, tell, you know, Lexi, heat up this or get that ready. And look, I'm not talking about a soup kitchen. I'm just talking about, in general... It's, our, it's your outlook towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. Folks, look, it's been my experience. You can have absolutely nothing in common with a brother or sister. Nothing. And yet you cannot shun that feeling that you have for them even when you try. You can't. And no matter how the interactions go, there may be times when you're very close. There may be times when you're very far away. But you just trust what the feeling never changes. If that person needs something and you got it, what do you do? You kind of give it to them, and you don't look give it to them hoping to get something in return. No. You, you witness to them first way I do it, then I give them some money, and let them go on. They ask me for that money, but they're going to hear the word of God. Yeah. Want money for food, you know? Yeah. Well, that's so the that, lost word. Give me the true word right now, then give them money. To yeah, if you want to help somebody lost, that's how you help them, man. Yeah. But watch what he goes on to say here, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not worked, is dead, being alone. This is the test of faith. Folks, if faith doesn't have the fruit that goes with it, it ain't faith. It's a false faith, right? Now he says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, I'll show you thy faith by my works. In other words, don't tell me, Lord, Lord, we did this, we did this, and we did that. What does a professing person do? I heard Benny Hinn just the other day, I was in there. Now does Benny Hinn get on TV and perform works that he believes are resemble what, what he thinks the Spirit of God does, he gets on TV and mimics, doesn't he? he? He legitimately believes that's how the Spirit operates. He's on TV mimicking it, right? When he got done, he went to this lady, I was talking to her, she had it on TV, and I was listening, and he started saying, let me tell you about this letter I got. Folks, I got this letter from so-and-so, and she this, and, and I said this, and I said that, and then this, and then that, and then in other words, he's telling all about this wonderful work, right? Why don't he just shut up and let the work speak for itself? Because if you're an actor, you must self-promote. If God doesn't promote you, what's the only way you're going to get promoted? You have to promote yourself, aren't you? There's the idea. Now he says, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Folks, believing in God won't save a person. It's necessary, but it won't save a person. Verse 20, Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? In other words, if you're professing to have this faith and you don't have the things that go along with it, that's not the real faith. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac upon the altar? This does not mean that Abraham got saved that day because he offered Isaac. That's salvation by works. What it means, justified, means declared right. Did Abraham say he was a man of faith? Yes. What did his faith say in chapter 22? There's right. the fruit. Mm -hmm. It produced the fruit, didn't it? Made perfect. Now, if you don't think it did, which one of y'all think you could kill your child like that if you had to? There ain't no way a natural person. You couldn't do it. No. Folks, that was as strong a testimony as you'd ever want to see. Yeah. It says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. In other words, he had part A and part B, didn't he? And they went together. And that's all he's talking about. And look, we could go on with this forever, but we're going to run out of time. But in chapter 6 of, Je of Hebrews, it's the same thing. He's saying, how in the world could a man get under conviction and hear this message and then totally reject it? What do you know about that man? He ain't got it. You ain't got folks. You, that's a counterfeit. Look... <laughs> I don't know any other way to say it than this. 
If you know that you are acting in a certain way, that's the clearest proof in the world that you ain't really that way. Otherwise, you wouldn't be acting. I don't mean just your general demeanor. Look, if you've got to force yourself to, to act a certain way, that's a clear acknowledgement to yourself that you're not that way. Y'all, You know what I mean, don't you? If you've got to put on a show in a thing, doesn't that tell you that you don't have the thing? Well, that's what these people do. What did they come to him and say? Lord, Lord, look at these incredible Christian works we've been doing. And what did the Lord say? You ain't done no work with me. You did some work. There might have been a spirit working with you, but it wasn't my spirit. I never placed my seed in you. You're not part of my bride. I never knew you. Depart from me. Get out of the wedding. You don't belong. I don't, I don't see how the Bible could be complete without what Abraham did with his son. It couldn't be, so. It's the greatest preaching of the gospel in the Old Testament. It's like, it's like it had to be put right down the middle. Yeah, yeah. It did. It's the greatest preaching of the gospel in the Old Testament, for sure. We, we as humans cannot even imagine. No. The religious system sees the work of it. It is. It is. Unless you don't get the stuff. You go. I tell you what, y'all go ahead and flip the first Corinthians. 